It's a spectacle. It's just vibrant. It's alive. It's the best of New York. The second biggest destination of fashion. This place is so unique. There's, there's no place else like it. It's just different. No one visits New York now and doesn't want to stop in and check out the meatpacking district. My father migrated to this country and came down to this market in 1928. I've been down here ever since. It was an incredibly busy neighborhood. That's what I always found it was. Lots of trucks, lots of people, meat swinging all over the place, and all fresh meat. So there I was, a 10-year-old boy, walking through swinging meat and just trailers and men and meat hooks. It was quite a wild ride. <laughs> I remember showing uh, a, a banker the area that's now the Gansevoort Hotel, which was a parking lot. Some tranny took a great liking to, uh, to this guy. And no, we, you know, I couldn't get him past three blocks because I finally said, Andre, listen, I don't know what you have in mind for this area, but I can't take this anymore. There were many crazy moments in this neighborhood. I mean, really, it was the Wild West. And then it's like traffic jam, drugs, prostitutes, people yelling, hey, Bob, and this, you know, and you go like, oh, fuck, you know, this is really cool. It was the meat market, and that's what it was. I'll never forget when the neighborhood started to transition. You know, the women rolling around in their Jimmy Choo's and their Gucci's and this kind of slipping and sliding in the streets that were covered in this sort of thin film of meat sludge. We brought the first retail into the neighborhood, which was Jeffrey's. And I was waiting there at nine in the morning and Jeffrey came with Michael, all his bankers, his lawyers, his real estate people. And there, the, you can just see everyone's face is like, this is disgusting, this place. This is getting us out of this neighbor. I mean, we were opening high-end retail. Everything's like $800 in a store. And all of a sudden, he just looks around. And he looks at me. He said, this is it. I put an ad in the Village Voice and uh, to take a chance to see if anybody might be interested in some, some new studios. I had 15 calls the first day. I went to Uncle Mike and my dad. I said, I think we've got something. Basically, 1990 is when we started converting our, our buildings here on uh, 13th and 14th Street to, uh, to uh, office lofts. It just felt like the neighborhood was, in my mind, about to burst. I mean, if there was a way to buy futures in a neighborhood, I would have bought them. The Greenwich Village Society um, wanted to think about landmarking and trying to find some mechanism to preserve the area. always that challenge of what of the past do you want to preserve and how do you take it into the future. Florent played a pivotal role. He was really a pioneer in this neighborhood. He was a frontiersman and he was a protector. I did not realize the importance I had in the neighborhood until it became time to organize. I think there was sort of a writing on the wall this neighborhood could be lost. And that's why it was really important to do it right then and to fight really, really hard and to have that success straight away. The struggle to preserve the historic context, the sense of place of the meatpacking district, was also very much at the same time as there was a fight in the neighborhood to prevent residential from moving into the core of the meatpacking district. There was a developer who was trying to put a 32-story Jean Nouvel tower at the site that is now the standard. And I knew that the moment that someone put million dollar condos within earshot of the cabs uh, or the trucks from the meat packers or the people coming out of bars or whatever, you know, that this neighborhood would die. And everyone told us we were going to lose. There was no way that a bunch of little ragtag retailers and, and meat packers were going to beat a major New York City developer. Obviously, nightlife is going to struggle to be nightlife if it's surrounded by a lot of residential uh, congestion. So that was a very important fight for us to be able to preserve the future of the meat packing district. I mean, we're really excited because we're moving back to the meat packing. We're building the new Highline headquarters, 
which is going to be right next to the Whitney, the Gansevoort, and the High Line. I went and spoke on behalf of the Whitney, and we're going to hear them building this building for two, three years. But imagine our kids are going to be able to walk outside and go to a world-class museum. The Whitney Museum, I think, just, you know, is the, the coup de grace. I mean, I think it just, it, it then takes uptown and sort of brings it fully down to the meatpacking area. And I think it completely changes the cultural dynamic of, uh, of Manhattan. We serve as a kind of anchor to the neighborhood and gives a balance because I think neighborhoods are best when they have a symbiotic relationship between the different functions of residential, commercial, and cultural. People are always telling me the meatpacking district's over. Um, and I just don't think that's the case. If you had said 20 years ago, you know, the meatpacking district is going to be a cultural hub. People would have looked at you like you were in some beef-induced overdose haze and you had lost your mind. I find it exciting, I find it growing, I find it, you know, from where it was to where it is now, it's just absolutely amazing. And I, and I, I, I love it down here. Whether you're an owner, a tenant, a shopkeeper, a restaurant, a fashion shop, a hotel operator, Everyone has a vested stake in, in helping add value to the community in those areas where the city of New York, through its good policies, just can't quite do enough. So that's the nature of these kinds of organizations, and, and we're thrilled and honored to be a part of it.